Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to ICICI Bank Limited Q3 FI24 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sandeep Bakshi, Managing Director and CEO of ICICI Bank. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening to all of you and welcome to the ICICI Bank earnings call to discuss the results for Q3 of financial year 24. Joining us today on this call are Sandeep Batra, Rakesh, Ajay, Anandya and Abhinay. The Indian economy continues to remain resilient with upward revision in the GDP growth estimate, the financial year 24 by RBI, reflecting the consistent actions and initiatives of the policy makers. As the liquidity and interest rate environment evolves, we would continue to monitor the developments closely. At ICICA Bank, a strategic focus continues to be on growing our core operating profit-less provisions i.e. profit before tax, excluding treasury, through the 360-degree customer-centric approach and by serving opportunities across ecosystems and micro-markets. We continue to operate within our strategic framework to strengthen our franchise and expand our technology and digital offerings. Maintaining high standards of governance, deepening coverage and enhancing delivery capabilities are our focus areas for risk-calibrated profitable growth. The profit before tax, excluding Treasury, grew by 23.4% year-on-year to 135.51 billion rupees in this quarter. The core operating profit increased by 10.3% year-on-year to 146.01 billion rupees in this quarter. The profit after tax grew by 23.6% year-on-year to 102.72 billion rupees in this quarter. Total deposits grew by 18.7% year-on-year and 2.9% sequentially at December 31, 2023. Term deposits increased by 31.2% year-on-year and 4.9% sequentially at December 31, 2023. During the quarter, the average current and savings account deposit grew by 5.3% year-on-year and 0.2% sequentially. The bank's average liquidity coverage ratio for the quarter was about 121%. The domestic loan portfolio grew by 18.8% year-on-year and 3.8% sequentially at December 31, 2023. The retail loan portfolio grew by 21.4% year-on-year and 4.5% sequentially. Including non-fund-based outstanding, the retail portfolio was 46.4% of the total portfolio. The business banking portfolio grew by 31.9% year-on-year and 6.5% sequentially. The SME portfolio grew by 27.5% year-on-year and 6.7% sequentially. The rural portfolio grew by 18.2% year-on-year and 4.6% sequentially. The domestic corporate portfolio grew by 13.3% year-on-year and 2.9% sequentially, driven by growth across well-rated financial and non-financial corporates. The overall loan portfolio, including the international branches portfolio, grew by 18.5% year-on-year and 3.9% sequentially at December 31, 2023. We continue to enhance our digital offerings and platforms to onboard new customers in a seamless manner, provide them end-to-end -end journeys and solutions, and enable more effective data-driven cross-sell and upsell. We have shared some details on our technology and digital offerings in slides 15 to 26 of the investor presentation. <clears throat> the net NPA ratio was 0.44% at December 31, 2023, compared to 0.43% at September 30, 2023, and 0.55% at December 31, 2022. During the quarter, there were net additions of 3.63 billion rupees to gross NPA including write-off and sales. The total provisions during the quarter were 
10.5 billion rupees or 7.2 percent of core operating profit and 0.36 percent of average advances. The provision coverage ratio on NPAs was 80.7 percent at December 31, 2023. In addition, the bank continues to hold contingency provision of 131 billion rupees or about 1.1 percent of total loans at December 31, 2023. The capital position of the bank continued to be strong with the CET1 ratio of 16.03%, their one ratio of 16.03%, and total capital adequacy of 16.70% at December 31, 2023, including profits for the nine months ended December 31, 2023. This includes the impact of recent regulatory guidelines on increasing the risk weights on consumer loans and credit to NBFCs. Looking ahead, we see many opportunities to drive risk calibrated profitable growth. We believe our focus on customer 360, extensive franchise and collaboration within the organization backed by our digital offering, process improvements and service delivery initiatives will enable us to deliver holistic solutions to customers in a seamless manner and grow market share across key segments. We continue to make investments in technology, people, distribution and building a brand. We remain focused on maintaining a strong balance sheet with prudent provisioning and healthy levels of capital. The principles of return of capital, fair to customer, fair to bank, and one bank, one team, one ROE will continue to guide our operations. We remain focused on delivering consistent and predictable returns to our shareholders. I now hand the call over to Anandir. Thank you, Sandeep. <clears throat> I will talk about loan growth, credit quality, p &L details, growth in digital offerings, portfolio trends, and performance of subsidiaries. Starting with loan growth, Sandeep covered the loan growth across various segments. Coming to the growth across retail products, the mortgage portfolio grew by 15.9% year-on-year and 3.7% sequentially. Auto loans grew by 22.5% year-on-year and 4.5% sequentially. The commercial vehicles and equipment portfolio grew by 14.8% year-on-year and 3.3% sequentially. Personal loans grew by 37.3% year-on-year and 6.4% sequentially compared to 40.4% year-on-year and 10.2% sequentially at September 30, 2023. The bank worked on increasing pricing, further refining credit parameters and optimizing sourcing costs resulting in lower disbursements of personal loans during the quarter as compared to the previous quarter. The credit card portfolio grew by 39.5% year-on-year and 11.5% sequentially. The personal loans and credit card portfolio were 9.4% and 4.1% of the overall loan book respectively at December 31st, 2023. The overseas loan portfolio in US dollar terms increased by 9.8% year-on-year at December 31st, 2023. The overseas loan portfolio was about 3.4% of the overall loan book. The non-India linked corporate portfolio declined by 30.4% or about 116 million US dollars on a year-on-year -year basis. Of the overseas corporate portfolio, about 92% comprises Indian corporates. 4% is overseas corporates with Indian linkage, 2% comprises companies owned by NRIs or PIOs, and the balance 2% is non-India corporates. Uh, moving on to credit quality, uh, there were net additions of 3.63 billion to gross NPAs in the current quarter, compared to 1.16 billion rupees in the previous quarter. The net additions to gross NPAs were 23.02 billion rupees in the retail, rural, and business banking portfolio, and there were net deletions of gross NPAs of 19.39 billion rupees in the corporate and SME portfolio. The gross NPA additions were 57.14 billion rupees in the current quarter compared to 46.87 billion rupees in the previous quarter. Recoveries and upgrades from gross NPAs, excluding write-offs and sales, were 53.51 billion rupees in the current quarter, compared to 45.71 billion rupees in the previous quarter. The gross NPA additions from the retail, rural, and business banking portfolio were 54.82 billion rupees in the current quarter, compared to 43.64 billion rupees in the previous quarter. 
there were gross NP additions of about 6.17 billion rupees from the Kisan credit card portfolio in the current quarter. We typically see higher NP additions from the Kisan credit card portfolio in the first and third quarter of a fiscal year. Recoveries and upgrades from the retail, rural, and business banking portfolio were 31.8 billion rupees compared to 30.19 billion rupees in the previous quarter. The gross NP additions from the corporate and SME portfolio were 2.32 billion rupees compared to 3.23 billion rupees in the previous quarter. Recoveries and upgrades from the corporate and SME portfolio were 21.71 billion rupees compared to 15.52 billion rupees in the previous quarter. The gross NPA written off during the quarter was 13.89 billion rupees. There was sale of NPAs worth 0.36 billion rupees in the current quarter compared to 1.79 billion rupees in the previous quarter. The sale of NPAs includes 0.29 billion rupees in cash and 0.07 billion rupees of security receipts. As these NPAs were fully provided, we continue to hold provisions against the security receipt. The non-fund based outstanding to borrowers classified as non-performing was 36.94 billion rupees as of December 31, 2023, compared to 38.86 billion rupees as of September 30th, 2023. The bank holds provisions amounting to 20.61 billion rupees against this non-fund based outstanding. The total fund based outstanding to all standard borrowers under resolution as per various guidelines declined to 33.18 billion rupees or about 0.3% of the total loan portfolio at December 31, 2023, from 35.36 billion rupees at September 30th, 2023. Of the total fund based outstanding under resolution at December 31, 2023, 27.82 billion rupees was from the retail, rural, and business banking portfolio, and 5.36 billion rupees uh, was from the corporate and SME portfolio. The bank holds provisions of 10.32 billion rupees against these borrowers, which is higher than the requirement as per RBI guidelines. Moving on to the PNL details, net interest income increased by 13.4% year on year to 186.78 billion rupees. The net interest margin was 4.43% in this quarter compared to 4.53% in the previous quarter and 4.65% in Q3 of last year. The sequential movement in MIN reflects the lagged impact of increase in term deposit rates over the last year on the cost of deposit. The impact of interest on income tax refund on net interest margin was four basis points in Q3 of this year compared to nil in the previous quarter and in Q3 of last year. The domestic MIM was at 4.52% this quarter compared to 4.61% in the previous quarter and 4.79% in Q3 of last year. The cost of deposits was 4.72% in this quarter compared to 4.53% in the previous quarter. Of the total domestic loans, interest rates on 49% are linked to the repo rate, 2% to other external benchmarks, and 18% to NCLR and other older benchmarks. The balance 31% of loans have fixed interest rates. Non-interest income, excluding Treasury, grew by 19.8% year-on-year to 59.75 billion rupees in Q3 of 2024. Fee income increased by 19.4% year on year to 53.13 billion rupees in this quarter. Fees from retail, rural, business banking, and SME customers constituted about 79% of the total fees in this quarter. Dividend income from subsidiaries and associates was 6.5 billion rupees in this quarter, compared to 5.16 billion rupees in Q3 of last year. The year-on-year increase in dividend income was primarily due to higher interim dividends from ICICI Securities, ICICI Prudential Asset Management, and ICICI Securities primary dealership. On cost, the bank's operating expenses increased by 22.3% year-on-year in this quarter. <clears throat> Employee expenses increased by 30.5% year-on-year in this quarter reflecting mainly the increase in the employee base from the second half of fiscal 2023 onwards. 
The bank had about 141,000 employees at December 31st, 2023. The number of employees has increased by about 23,600 in the last 12 months and about 1,700 in the current quarter. Non-employee expenses increased by 17.8% year-on-year in this quarter, primarily due to retail business-related and technology expenses. Our branch count has increased by 123 uh, in Q3 of 2024, and we had 6,371 branches as of December 31, 2023. The technology expenses were about 9% of our operating expenses in the nine months ended December 31, 2023. Uh, the core operating profit increased by 10.3% year on year to 146.01 billion rupees in this quarter, excluding dividend income from subsidies and associates. The core operating profit grew by 9.7% year on year. The total provisions during the quarter were 10.5 billion rupees, or 7.2% of core operating profit and 0.36% of average advances, compared to 5.83 billion rupees in the previous quarter. The provisions during the quarter included the impact of 6.27 billion rupees pursuant to the recent RBI circular on investments in alternative investment funds. The provisioning coverage on NPAs was 80.7% as of December 31, 2023. Uh, in addition, we hold 10.32 billion rupees of provisions on borrowers under resolution. Further, the bank continues to hold contingency provision of 131 billion rupees as of December 31st, 2023. At the end of December, the total provisions, other than specific provisions on fund-based outstanding to borrowers classified as non-performing, were 230.25 billion rupees, or 2% of loan. The profit before tax, excluding Treasury, grew by 23.4% year-on-year to 135.51 billion rupees in Q3 of this year. There was a Treasury gain of 1.23 billion rupees in Q3 compared to 0.36 billion rupees in Q3 of the previous year. The tax expense was 34.02 billion rupees in this quarter compared to 27.02 billion rupees in the corresponding quarter last year. The profit after tax grew by 23.6% year on year to 102.72 billion rupees in this quarter. Growth in digital offerings, uh, leveraging digital and technology across businesses is a key element of our strategy of growing the risk calibrated core operating profit. We continue to see increasing adoption and usage of our digital platforms by our customers. There have been more than 10 million activations of iMobile Pay by non ICICI bank account holders at end December 2023. Our merchant stack offers an array of banking and value-added services to retailers, online businesses, and large e-commerce firms, such as digital current account opening, interest overdraft facilities based on point-of-sale transactions, connected banking services, and digital store management, among others. We have created more than 20 industry-specific stacks, which provide bespoke and purpose-based digital solutions to corporate clients and their ecosystem. Our trade online and trade emerge platforms allow customers to perform most of their trade finance and foreign exchange transactions digitally. Our digital solutions integrate the import transaction life cycle with solutions providing frictionless experience to the client and simplify customer journeys. About 72% of trade transactions were done digitally in Q3 of 2024. The volume of transactions through the trade online platform in Q3 of 2024, grew by 26.2% year on year. We have further simplified <coughs> cross border remittance journeys with new enhancements. Smart IRM is a multi party cross border inward remittance solution with virtual account architecture, enhanced security features, and remittances reconciliation with payer identification. Smart ORM enables pre vetting of outward remittance transactions to ensure ever free submission before booking foreign exchange deals. iLens, the retail lending platform currently enabled for mortgages, is being upgraded on an ongoing basis with new features such as integration with account aggregators, opening of instant paperless savings bank accounts for newly onboarded mortgage customers, and instant property valuation reports for select developers to provide enhanced customer experience and serve the customer's 360-degree needs digitally. 
uh, moving on, we have provided details on our retail business banking and SME portfolio in slide 32 to 43 of the investor presentation. Uh, the loan and non fund based outstanding to performing corporate and SME borrowers rated double B and below was 58.53 billion rupees at December 31, 2023, compared to 47.89 billion rupees at September 30, 2023, and 55.81 billion rupees at December 31, 2022. Uh, this portfolio is about 0.5% of our advances at December 31, 2023. Other than two accounts, the maximum single borrower outstanding in the double B and below portfolio was less than 5 billion rupees at December 31, 2023. At December 31, 2023, we held provisions of 9.25 billion rupees uh, on the double B and below portfolio compared to 8.17 billion rupees at September 30, 2023. This includes provisions held against borrowers under resolution included in this portfolio. The total outstanding to NDFCs and HFCs was 784.84 billion rupees at December 31, 2023 compared to 837.49 billion rupees at September 30th, 2023. The total outstanding loans to NBFCs and HFCs were about 6.8% of our advances at December 31, 2023. The builder portfolio, including construction finance, lease rental discounting, term loans, and working capital was 456.85 billion rupees at December 31, 2023 compared to 430.58 billion rupees at September 30th, 2023. The builder portfolio is about 4% of our total loan portfolio. Our portfolio largely comprises well-established builders, and this is also reflected in the sequential increase in the portfolio. About 3% of the builder portfolio uh, at uh, December 31, 2023, was either rated double B and below internally, or was classified as non-performing. Uh, compared to 3.5% at September 30th, 2023. Uh, moving on to the consolidated results, the consolidated profit after tax grew by 25.7% year on year to 110.53 billion rupees in this quarter. The details of the financial performance of subsidies and key associates are covered in slides 46 to 49 in the investor presentation. The annualized premium equivalent of ICICI life was 54.3 billion rupees in nine months ended December 31, 2023, compared to 53.41 billion rupees uh, in nine months of last year. The value of new business margin uh, uh, was 26.7% in nine months ended December 31, 2023, compared to 32% in nine months of last year and 32% in fiscal 2023. The value of new business was 14.51 billion rupees in the nine months ended December 31, 2023, compared to 17.1 billion rupees in the nine months of last year. The profit after tax of ICICI life was 6.79 billion rupees uh, in nine months ended December 31, 2023, compared to 5.76 billion rupees in nine months of last year, and 2.27 billion rupees in Q3 of 2024, compared to 2.21 billion rupees in Q3 of 2023. The gross direct premium income of ICICI General was 62.3 billion rupees in this quarter compared to 54.93 billion rupees in the same quarter last year. The combined ratio stood at 103.6% uh, in Q3 of 2024 compared to 104.4% uh, in Q3 of 2023. Uh, excluding the impact of CAC losses, the combined ratio was 102.3% in this quarter. The profit after tax was 4.31 billion rupees in this quarter compared to 3.53 billion rupees in Q3 last year. The profit after tax of ICICI AMC as per NDS was 5.46 billion rupees in this, uh, this quarter compared to 4.20 billion rupees in Q3 of last year. The profit after tax uh, of ICIC securities as per NDS on a consolidated basis was 4.66 billion rupees in this quarter compared to 2.81 billion rupees in Q3 of last year. ICIC Bank Canada had a profit after tax of 15.9 million Canadian dollars in this quarter compared to 11.5 million Canadian dollars in Q3 last year. Uh, ICICI Bank UK 
had a profit after tax of 6.7 million US dollars this quarter compared to 3.1 million US dollars in Q3 of last year. As per NDS, ICICI Home Finance had a profit after tax of 1.86 billion rupees in the current quarter compared to 1.05 billion rupees in Q3 of last year. With this, we conclude our opening remarks and we will be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, you may press star and 1 to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Maruka Jania from Nuama. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. I just wanted to uh, know about uh, operating expenses. They've not grown much this quarter. So going ahead, do we expect this kind of growth or any comments on the OPEX bit? That's my first question. And then I have two more. Yeah, so as far as the operating expenses is concerned, I think if we look at the non-employee expenses, uh, those are really growing in line with the business. And uh, this quarter, of course, the advertising and sales promotion expenses on a year-on-year basis, uh, the growth was on the higher side because of the festive season-related uh, spend. While last year, the festive season was, uh, you know, split over Q2 and Q3. Uh, so those are really, uh, you know, going in line with the business. On the employee side, I think is where we have seen uh, in recent, over the last, um, I would say, couple of years, uh, uh, you know, last maybe six quarters, a pretty high uh, growth because of uh, the the increase in the uh, in the team size uh, of the bank. Uh, but uh, as you would have uh, seen uh, in this quarter, the uh, high net uh, increase has uh, slowed down. I mean. Uh, Compared to about 10,000, I think 10 to 11,000 in the first half, we were at about 1,700 in Q3. So, uh, you know, we we would, uh, I think, uh, not be uh, probably looking at uh, adding the kind of headcount uh, at the same pace. So that will play through uh, into the operating expenses as we go ahead. Okay, so the headcount additions now will be moderate only. This is not just a one-off. They will not be at the pace that we have seen over the last, uh, you know, uh, over the previous four to five quarters, yeah. Got it. And just in terms of LDR, uh, there's a lot of discussion around it already. You are okay, but do you have any uh, path on LDR? I mean, would you like to retain LDR at current levels or bring it down? Um, any views on that? So the way we look at, you know, the balance sheet and the funding structure, Amaro, is that we look at, uh, I would say, three ratios. Uh, certainly the CD ratio or the LDR, the LCR, which is a measure of, uh, you know, current liquidity, uh, and the NSFR or the net stable funding ratio. So the uh, LCR and the NSFR are a little more granular in the sense that they do take into account uh, the nature of assets and liabilities. Uh, in terms of, you know, product, uh, counterparty, and uh, tenor. Uh, so we look at all three. If we look at the, uh, uh, you know, the LCR and the NSFR, uh, we are at, a, you know, well above the regulatory minimum. We are, you know, at about 120%. Uh, on the uh, credit-to-deposit ratio, uh, I think a couple of things. One, uh, typically, bank, you know, a bank with a higher level of capital uh, would tend to have also a higher, uh, you know, CD ratio uh, mathematically. Uh, when we uh, look at our CD ratio, we also look at the overseas operations and uh, the uh, uh, domestic balance sheet separately because they are managed separately. And uh, you know, in the overseas operations, we have uh, relatively limited deposit taking capability. Of course, uh, now the impact is much lower than it used to be. Say seven, eight years ago because that portfolio has come down to, you know, less than 5% of our overall portfolio, but it does have, you know, a percentage point of, or two of impact. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, the bulk of the balance sheet, which is the, the domestic uh, balance sheet, of course, uh, you know, deposits are our primary source of funding. Uh, 
uh, be uh, uh, along with capital. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we always try to optimize between the wholesale deposit taking and the more stable, uh, you know, uh, wholesale sources like refinance and uh, and bonds. So, uh, in general, if you look at it over a longer period of time, on the domestic balance sheet, our uh, CD ratio has kind of hovered around the mid 80s, uh, other than you know periods of very high liquidity and very low loan growth, uh, like the pandemic. So that is kind of the way in which uh, we manage it, uh, looking at all these three ratios uh, on an ongoing basis. Got it. And assuming that rates will remain stable, would you say that your margins have now bottomed out and this would be the level at, uh, or is deposit competition too strong to say that? Assuming no change in policy rates. Uh, so, uh, on the deposit side, I think the retail deposit rates uh, have remained stable for a fair period of time now, at least the peak rate. Although, I think at various points of time, banks have moved up and down in certain other buckets. Um, of course, uh, in, in, uh, in Q3, I think given the overall liquidity environment, we did see uh, some amount of hardening of the wholesale deposit rate. Uh, which is reflected in the CD rates and also, you know, the rates being quoted for, uh, you know, high value uh, kind of deposit. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think if you look at even currently systemic liquidity is running at a negative. So I guess uh, that scenario will stay, uh, you know, for some time until, uh, you know, maybe a monetary policy starts to turn a little more accommodative. So, uh, that's on the deposit rate side. Uh, from a margin perspective, uh, I guess, uh, you know, we uh, have said, uh, we have said in the past that uh, we expect uh, the, the full year margin this year to be at a similar level uh, than last year. And uh, that implies uh, some further, uh, you know, uh, margin compression in Q4, but it should be, uh, you know, much lower than what we have uh, seen. I mean, Q3 was already, uh, you know, much lower than Q2 and it should be lower than what we have seen in Q3. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. A request to all the participants, please restrict to two questions per participant. Next question is from the line of Abhishek Maraka from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. <clears throat> so two questions, one on uh, asset quality. So if I see your slippages in retail, rural, business banking, that has gone up, even if I knock off the Kisan uh, credit card slippages. So can you explain where that has come from? And uh, uh, similarly, on the recoveries and upgrades in corporate and SME, is there any kind of one-off or w what's happened there? That also improved, actually. So. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, I think as far as the retail side is concerned, nothing specific to call out. I think uh, it's really spread across products. And if you look at the delta relative to the size of the portfolio, it is uh, not uh, very high, not particularly um, meaningful. Uh, so I, as we have been saying, we would expect, you know, the net additions, on, uh, both the gross and net additions on the retail side to gradually normalize upwards, both as the portfolio uh, grows and, and seasons. Um, uh, uh, and I'll, uh, you know, uh, on the corporate uh, side, we did have, uh, you know, one or two larger um, sort of upgrades uh, this quarter. Uh, but in a way, the benefit uh, in, in provisioning terms of that uh, was uh, kind of uh, offset by the uh, provisioning on the AIS. So uh, investments. So you know, taking it all together, if we look at kind of the credit costs, you know, if we look at the provisioning for the quarter and eliminate, you know, maybe a very chunky corporate upgrade, eliminate uh, the AIS provisioning, and really try and uh, look at an uh, you know an adjusted number, it would be still below uh, kind of maybe 50 bits of loans and about 10 bits of the PPOP. So that is, um, you know, uh, uh, the context in which we would look at uh, the NPL formation and recoveries uh, you know, from our from our planning and risk appetite perspective. Yeah, and and uh, sort of extending that, uh, does it mean that even in the next few quarters we should continue to see, uh, you know, 
thread costs in that range because you have enough PCR anyway, and that can come down a little bit. Uh, so thread costs can remain low for a let's say next three to four quarters. Is that a fair conclusion? We don't really give uh, forward-looking, uh, uh, you know, thing. But I would say that, yeah. I mean, I don't see uh, anything imminently that would, uh, you know, cause it to spike up. There will be some gradual normalization upwards. Got it. And my second question is just on cost of deposits. If you can share, uh, you know, maybe your incremental cost of TDs or incremental cost of deposits, anything that you may have handy. Uh, that would be helpful. So we are not, uh, we don't publish those, uh, that, those numbers, uh, Abhishek. Okay, got it, got it. Got it, thank you and all the best. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Rikin Shah from IIFR, please go ahead. Thank you for taking the question. I just have one question on um, cost of deposits. Uh, if you could just qualitatively comment as to the repricing on the existing book of uh, TD, uh, would you say that by 4Q, uh, large, or most of it would already be repriced into the PNL, or it could flow into 1Q as well? There could be some flow into 1Q as well, uh, but uh, I think uh, you know, in, in most of it should be done in 2 4 uh, There could be some flow into 1Q as well. In this quarter, uh, it increased a 20 bit QOQ. So, in terms of the quantum, uh, should it be kind of uh, uh, slowing down from the current convict? I, I would get so. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Next question is from the line of Kunal Shah from SETI Group. Please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thanks for taking the question. So the question is on yield. Uh, when we uh, look at it, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, rise in some of the high-yielding portfolio, uh, sequential growth has been strong. And we would have increased the rates, uh, uh, even suppose the tweaking of the uh, risk weights by RBI, but still overall yield on advances are down. So just want to understand on that bit. And this entire NBFC rundown which has been there, is it like we tried to pass it on in terms of the rates and then there were repayments or we have been conservative post the risk weight stance from RBI? So on the first question, I think <clears throat> part of the impact on the advances yield is because of the addition to the KCC NPL. So <clears throat> basically what happens is that uh, you kind of have to uh, you de-recognize uh, a year's worth of uh, uh, interest income. So that does impact the yield on advances. Uh, in uh, other, uh, uh, you know, other parts, one, if you look at the share of the high yielding portfolio, uh, it is still uh, not, that, not that high and we have been, and we have seen decent growth in mortgages and auto and so on. <clears throat> Uh, and, and also on the corporate side, so uh, which continue to be uh, you know pretty competitive. So I would say the yields have been broadly stable, and to some extent, uh, any mixed benefit that could have come has been offset by the uh, non-accrual on the KCC uh, loan. Uh, on the sorry, the second question was on the NDFC exposure. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess uh, that. Uh, we, uh, you know, that we keep looking at the various exposures from a risk reward basis. I mean, we did not have any credit concerns uh, on these exposures, but they were, uh, you know, finely priced exposures, and uh, you know, we have uh, therefore, you know, the, the borrower, uh, borrower, couple of borrowers uh, prepaid, and we were quite okay with that. And how much rate pass on was there in NBFC? We, it would really depend on the client. I don't think there is any uh, rule of thumb in that sense. Uh, I, I would, as you see, the book itself. I mean, even adjusting for uh, uh, this repayment, uh, uh, you know, has not really grown much during the quarter. So there would not have been any uh, very large lending that would have happened the cash. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity and congrats on good results. 
so uh, one question again around the yield and, and as to really how do you look at the competitive intensity in unsecured products and uh, even in the mortgage are you seeing that lenders cutting down on spreads because the repo rates have been unchanged but are the rates like seeing some moderation there and uh, uh, so basically and and going forward how do you see the unsecured loan mix also moving for the bank because until now it has been going very steady and some other private banks are indicating that they will continue to drive that up so what will be our approach on the unsecured loan mix so these two questions so uh, i think as far as the mark competitive intensity in uh, rates uh, that is kind of uh, continuing uh, i mean we'll have to see if uh, things change in q4 but uh, certainly in q3 across most of the products uh, mortgages and corporate lending we continue to see a fair degree of uh, competitive intensity um, the way we look at it is uh, you know uh, to try and uh, you know be disciplined in our pricing and uh, to to kind of uh, look at the customer and see uh, what are the what is the total relationship value that we can have with the client and their uh, ecosystem and then take a call on the loan pricing i mean we uh, in general are not particularly focused on loan growth so in that sense uh, we we are able to calibrate our pricing decision Uh, i sorry what was your second question i yeah so just related to this like has your aggregate mortgage portfolio yield uh, come down over say second quarter no it could not have because the incremental business takes time to feed through uh, i i you you had another question after the yield com- competitive mix i'm sorry on this and and uh, that was like on the unsecured loan mix How do you yeah, see that trending further? Yeah. So on the unsecured loan mix, I think uh, as far as personal loans is concerned, as we have mentioned, you know, we have taken some uh, steps uh, in terms of refining the credit parameters. Basically, in any portfolio, you have certain cohorts which contribute more uh, to the delinquency, and you try to uh, figure out what are the origination markers of those cohorts, and then cut origination in uh, those particular segments, which is what we've done, and we've also you know a rationalized for example sourcing payouts as well as we moved up pricing on personal loans by uh, by maybe 20 25 basis points uh, so i i would expect that uh, you know growth in that portfolio uh, may continue to uh, moderate a little bit uh, even from a current level but uh, you know from overall pnl impact i i would think that it should not have much of a pnl impact because you know it the in any uh, product or or business it's not just about the yield and the margin uh, you know hopefully if we are managing the sourcing cost well and that will uh, you know contribute to profitability and hopefully if we are you know reducing in the right cohort uh, that will contribute to uh, credit costs uh, you know being better as well right and around credit costs any comments around that Uh, no i think i uh, spoke earlier in relation to uh, your question i mean I, i do agree that there is some noise in that line item this quarter because of the ais and the large corporate recovery but if one kind of tries to smoothen that out as i said we are uh, would be at about maybe 50 bits of loans and uh, you know 10% uh, of the ppp so it is quite well contained and sort of within our risk capital Okay, sure. Thank you, Anil. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Next question is from the line of M B Mahesh from Kodak Securities. Please go ahead. Anil, just <coughs> Anil, just two questions. One is on flight thirty four. Um, there has been a drop in the double A kind of a rated portfolio, and an increase yeah. in the triple B part of the portfolio. Which is kind of strange. yeah so uh, actually mahesh i think two things largely explain that one is that uh, you know the reduction in the ndfc portfolio uh, you know most of our ndfc portfolio is well rated uh, rated a and above so uh, as a result of the reduction in that portfolio we would have seen some reduction in the outstanding in the higher rated uh, category uh, and the second uh, factor was that uh, we had a uh, one of the one of the larger upgrades 
of NPLs that we had, uh, you know, got upgraded, uh, uh, got rated in the Triple D family uh, on upgrade. So it's one, uh, so one is a sort of, uh, I, I would say, you know, positive movement from a capital and profitability perspective. The other is a positive movement from a credit perspective. But yeah, because of those two, the mix uh, does look a sli look uh, slightly different. Uh, you know. Okay. Um, second question: uh, Is there a interest towards an impact on the account of the KPC platform, which is meaningful? So we have not really given a number. I mean that part of the sort of margin happens every first and third quarter. So no, we have not called out that number separately. I mean, just call, uh, I didn't get the line of thought. Uh, uh, on the unsecured loans, are you saying that things have started to worsen, or you say that uh, it is at the margin remaining more or less the same? So I think it is remaining more or less the same. I mean, we have been looking at that portfolio very closely. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, in any portfolio at any point of, time, uh, point of time, there's always a bottom cohort which one could sort of do without. And given the overall... Uh, commentary on uh, on per, on per unsecured and uh, the increase in capital charge and so on. We have uh, you know tried to sort of uh, trim that part of the portfolio. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Chintan Joshi from Autonomous. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sorry, can I just follow up on that unsecured uh, point you made? So you mentioned that uh, some cohorts are seeing uh, different delinquency trends on unsecured. If you were to do cohorts by time of origination, uh, you know, is the recent uh, kind of uh, origination seeing uh, different delinquency trends? So not 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 breaking cohort by by uh, quality, but by time. Uh, are you seeing any difference? Yeah, I think the markers we look at are more uh, in terms of you know the. The characteristics of the customer and you know how uh, you know try and find wherever you know, you know if, if we are able to look at delinquency in terms of the characteristics of the customer and see what kind of uh, loan uh, barriers are contributing more to delinquency. It's not to do with time as much. And if you do look at time, is it similar trends so far as? Uh, Say a loan uh, given at the at the end of you know COVID and versus kind of in the last six months. I don't think we have really commented on that. Okay. Uh, the other question I had was on uh, cost of deposits. It increased uh, 19 bits quarter on quarter. Uh, you know you are indicating uh, some more NIM pressure, but I doubt uh, you know you're referring. Like if I think about the exit run rate. Uh, if I keep uh, NIMS uh, flat uh, on a FI24 versus FI23 basis, then it would be kind of 4.2. But that that I don't think that's what you are trying to imply. So if I break that down a little bit more, could you give some color on how much more repricing is left on the deposit side uh, that we can factor in? We've not given really a, how much more repricing on the deposit side. Uh, I think what we said is that there will be some more increase in the cost of deposits in Q4 and possibly a little bit into Q1 as well. Uh, it should be less than uh, what we have seen, and uh, the min uh, impact should also be less than what we have seen uh, in this quarter. Okay, and a final quick one. Any, uh, any indication on branch expansion number or FI25? No, not really. I think uh, this okay. quarter we added about one, 123 branches. So, uh, as we have said in the past, we follow a pretty uh, bottom-up approach. I mean, uh, uh, it's the people closest to the market who kind of uh, recommend uh, branch openings, and then we do some assessment and open it. So, we are not holding back on any branch opening, but we don't have a particular branch opening target either. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Param Subramanian from Namora. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so on the average uh, CASA ratio, um, so if you look at it quarter on quarter, we are not seeing any you know, let up in the pace at which it, this is moderating. Uh, so any you know indication on where you see this, say, um, uh, bottom out is starting to pick up or 
um you know um, or do we have to wait for a much more uh, looser uh, liquidity environment like you were alluding to earlier yeah so uh, well, i think this is something you're seeing to varying degrees across the system uh, across all banks uh, i i think uh, in our context uh, we are probably doing a, a relatively better on the current account side i think our payment products and payment platforms uh, are contributing to that uh, to to uh, higher float uh, balances uh, on the saas side uh, i think it's much more a function of uh, interest rate and uh, consumption uh, so i i guess uh, Uh, you know i don't have an answer uh, at the moment i think we will have to wait for a couple of quarters and uh, you know eventually see how things pan out next year as uh, liquidity uh, sort of uh, normalizes in the system got it uh, and india just one more question i think around this but uh, how are we geared towards say government spend coming back um, yeah, how much is that you know if so if you can give some direction number as a percentage of our deposit say so when that comes back Uh, how does that help you in terms of casa uh, uh, as well as overall deposits yeah. so we don't uh, take i mean our, our focus as far as the government is concerned is more from providing solutions which enable them to uh, manage their uh, cash flow and you know provide mis reconciliation digital solutions so yeah that the flow of that money uh, through our system does create flow Uh, it is a uh, you know some part of our uh, base, uh, but one one uh, caveat is that the government is also becoming uh, progressively more efficient in the way in terms of the way in which it manages its uh, finances. So you know I don't think one can rely too much on idle government money lying with you in in casa form. <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot, Avit. Um, Anandya, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that as the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, taking the time on a Saturday evening, as always, and uh, happy to speak uh, on any other clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of ICICI Bank Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.